I would like to just acknowledge that we have a special guest here tonight besides Leslie, and it's a this woman is very well loved in our community, very well known. We've loved her books, we've loved her person, we've loved her <laughs> presence in our lives for so many years. Many <laughs> Bruce Pratt is yeah. here. society and there 
a lot of the very people that I would have wanted to talk to um, felt very put off by talking to someone who had published a book. And I thought, well, that's a shame because <laughs> that's exactly why I wrote it, is to be able to have that kind of one-on-one -on -one discussion. So I'm going to break that down by telling you some things like, for example, the reason I'm in sock feet is I left my shoes in Tallahassee. Um, that's not something a sophisticated person does. <laughs> and if they do, they sure as hell wouldn't come up here and tell you. Um, I'm actually wearing Minnie Bruce Pratt's uh, Birkenstocks, so my feet are just killing me. <laughs> and um, for those of you, I know everybody knows Minnie Bruce's poetry and essays here, but you may not know that Minnie Bruce and I met one year ago. This is our anniversary, last night and today. And um, so we're traveling through the South together, reading individually, reading together. Um, and this is the Minnie Bruce Pratt, Leslie Feinberg, Anniversary and Commitment Southern Tour 93. <laughs> and we exchanged rings and, and slipped off to St. George Island last night. And so, <laughs> so you see, <laughs> I'm very approachable. Somebody said to me, they said, oh, gee, you don't look as scary as you do in that photo on the cover. <laughs> scary? Me? Damn. Anyway, um, I'm going to read a piece from Stonebush Blues and then uh, open up for discussion. If you're all not too hot and sweltering in here, you can stay and talk. Um, I'm going to assume you haven't read Stonebush Blues Oh, that was wrong. <laughs> but maybe you haven't read the last 30 pages. <laughs> um, it might be a way, I mean, here, we just started out on this tour, and we got to the first bookstore, and they said, <gasps> the book, it's a thousand copies have gone out without the last 30 pages. And I thought, well, this is when a 12-step program is wonderful, you know, because I just said, I can't do anything about that. <laughs> nothing to be done. Um, I thought it was a very creative solution to sign stickers or whatever. Um, the book will be ready Friday and will get shipped out very quickly because of course the bookstores are mad at the distributor and the distributor's mad at the printer and you know, so they're going to get them out real fast. But it's a great problem for me because they doubled the run in the first press and, and it sold out in 90 days. And that meant that um, it wasn't just my friends who were listening. You know, <laughs> that means a lot to me. So the, the biggest problem I have is that the next 5,000 got messed up. Well, a week from now, that'll be solved. But it means that um, I've lived long enough to see the world change again. And it's a good thing to remember, especially in hard times, that uh, you, know, you keep fighting and you keep struggling and you keep looking for allies and you find them and it changes again. So, for those of you who haven't read it, I'll just give you my little by rope thumbnail sketch of this book and then I'll tell you where I'm reading from in it. Um, this book is in the first person, the first person narrative, because, first of all, I didn't want to give you an inch of distance emotionally from having to live through cover to cover what the protagonist, Jeff Goldberg, lives through. And second of all, English is a very difficult subject to write about gender difference in the third person. You would have spent so much time saying he and she in the same sentence instead of just living through that person's eyes that I thought it would be a little distracting. So the book is about a young girl, Jess Goldberg, who grows up differently gendered in the 1950s in a blue collar town. Now by differently gendered or transgendered, what I mean is that uh, she grew up at a time, for those of you who didn't live through the McCarthy era, we've lived to see that change too, that uh, you either looked like Ozzy or Harriet. And you didn't have a choice about which you could look like either. But there was no range in between. Girls were stamped out a certain way and boys were stamped out a certain way. And uh, if you were a tomboy, you had maybe, oh, a year or so to be cute. And then you better change. Um, and even that might not have been considered too cute <laughs> in some quarters. Um, so in a 
very simplified way, I mean that this is a child who grew up looking masculine as a girl child in a world that would not allow her to look anything except feminine or punish her for it. And she did get punished for it. And it's about the second quarter of the book then looks like what it was like to come out and find a community of people who seemed as different as Jess felt. And uh, that really explored what it was like to come out during the, uh, in the factories and the stone, pre-Stonewall bars in Buffalo. And, you know, I'm amazed. I, I remember a butch came up to me who had been out for like 15 years in Buffalo, and she said to me, you mean they used to raid the bars? And I thought, gee, you know, if you don't know that, <laughs> we've got to be talking about this stuff, because really, it's the movement we built that changed a lot of this, you know. Um, and then the book explores what it is like to be differently gendered or transgendered and um, lose that community and lose your ability to work in a recession. Now, if you can't work in this society, you got nothing. Nothing except trouble. And uh, there are some, you know, who I, I've heard say, well, you know, you can understand why women would want to join the enemy when they're under so much pressure economically or as lesbians, but the book makes you look at who is able to pass as the opposite sex. You know, not every woman who wants to could. We're really talking about somebody who's differently gendered and whose experience may be different from yours and maybe not. And so at this point, the book explores what it's like to live as the opposite sex, to be the same person looking out the same eyes and have the world treat you so differently. Um, and then the last part of the book kind of comes full circle to being gender ambiguous in a world in which if people have to ask if you're a man or a woman, it doesn't really matter so much what the answer is. You, the crime is that it had to be asked in the first place. So you're already in trouble. Um, this isn't the story of every transgender person. I mean, certainly that community has such a broad umbrella term that could unite people who are consider themselves transsexual, transvestite, androgynes, gender benders, bearded women, female illusionists. There are just so many people who don't fit those lines, those boundaries of sex and gender that have been drawn. Um, in this society. But I hope that if you lived through one person's story and thought about it, uh, that it would shape your thinking in a little different way, that you might be open to listening to other people's stories too, that you might never heard, or people you might have passed on the street and not given a second thought about their humanity. So the part that I'm going to read from is at that noble point where Jess is about to start taking hormones and pass as a man. She doesn't know what's coming, but she can't live much longer the way things are. And it means going from being gender outlaw above ground to being gender outlaw underground. And it means saying goodbye to your past. It means saying goodbye to the people who do love you and do know you. And, uh, and disappear. You know, rewrite your past and become a new person. Uh, you start from the day you pass. And so two of the people that Jess says goodbye to are Kim and Scotty, who are two kids of a co-worker. And that's where I'm going to read from. Can you all hear me back there? Nothing happened for the first two months. My voice hadn't deepened. I knew that for a fact because every day I called telephone information and the operators still called me ma'am. The only changes I could notice were not what I had hoped for. My skin broke out, my body plumping, my mood swung. Whatever was going to emerge wasn't here yet but it was coming. I'd have to say goodbye to Kim and Scotty soon. Their mother Gloria would never let me see the kids once I started to change. On a wintry Saturday, I arranged to take them to the zoo. It was snowing so hard that the bus ride to Gloria's house seemed to take forever. 
I'm going away, I told Gloria. You want more coffee, she asked. I covered my cup with one hand and shook my head. Gloria sat down next to me. You tell the kids yet? I shook my head. Those kids think the sun rises and sets with you. I don't get it. Her words wounded me. I'm lovable, Gloria. What can I tell you? <laughs> she shook her head. Be careful when you tell them, okay? They're still shook up about their father and me splitting up. Scotty and Kim practically knocked each other over running into the kitchen to greet me. They were both so bundled up I could only see their eyes between their hats and their scarves. Gloria tossed me the keys to her car. She looked upset. Be careful driving in the snow. I didn't think that's what she was concerned about. Don't worry about us, I told her. By the time we got to the zoo, the snow was deep and fat flakes continued to fall. There weren't many people out, just a few parents with their kids. Let's make snow angels, Kim suggested. Not yet, I told her. Let's not get wet till we're ready to leave. I could see the profile of a golden eagle on her perch. When we got closer, I realized there were two eagles, a male and female, sitting next to each other. The female hopped down into the snow and unfolded her powerful wings. She leaped and whirled in the snow. I remember the newspaper reported her egg had hatched last week, but the eaglet had died. I wondered if she danced in bitter grief. What's he doing, Kim asked me. She's playing in the snow. I figured it was as good an answer as any. That's the girl eagle. How do you know, she asked. Because the girls are bigger than the boys. Both kids spotted the polar bears before I did and ran ahead. The mother bear was out with her cub. According to the newspaper, the cub was born three months ago and hadn't been out seen outside of the cave yet. <coughs> Oh, the kids cooed as the cub toppled over into a snowbank. The mother bear sat back on her haunches. The little bear rooted for her breast and suckled. I'm hungry, Scotty announced. The concession stand was almost deserted inside. Two zoo maintenance men sipped hot coffee in the corner. I ordered hot dogs and hot chocolates. We need peanuts, Kim reminded me, for the animals. I don't think we're supposed to feed them, I told her. Then we need peanuts for us, she said. <laughs> and three bags of peanuts, I added to the man behind the counter. He glared at me in open disgust. Oh, please, I thought, not in front of the kids. I got my money ready. The faster the transaction, the better. He came back with the food and drinks in a cardboard container. That'll be nine eighty, sir, he smirked. I threw a ten dollar bill on the counter and picked up the container. Keep the change, ma'am, I told him. <laughs> Come on, kids, wanna eat outside on a park bench? It was okay with Scotty. Kim didn't seem so sure. I brushed the snow off the bench. Why did he, why did you call him ma'am, Kim asked. I shrugged, he was being mean to me. She wouldn't let it go. He didn't like you? I shook my head. Why not? How does he know he doesn't like you? I don't know, I told her. Don't you ever meet bullies at school or mean to you for no reason? She nodded. Why did he call you sir? Doesn't he know you're a girl? I sighed and put my hot dog back in the cardboard container. The last bite I chewed was stuck like a knot in my throat. I sipped some hot chocolate before I answered. He knew I was a girl. He was picking on me because I'm different. 
I anticipated her next question. I don't look like your mom. I look different from a lot of other girls. Some people don't like that. They don't think that's right. Kim knitted her eyebrows. Then why don't you wear dresses and let your hair grow long like other girls? I smiled. Don't you like me the way I am? Scotty looked up at me and beamed. I wiped the ketchup off his nose with my glove. I don't want to change, I told him. I think girls and boys should be able to be any way they want to be without getting picked on. Kim knelt on the bench facing me. She took off her gloves and stroked my cheeks. I wondered if she could see beard growth already. What do you see, I asked her. She shrugged and put her gloves back on. You know what we're getting you for Christmas? A radio, Scotty told me excitedly. <laughs> Scotty, Kim's voice rose in anger, you weren't supposed to tell, you ruined it. Scotty's eyes filled with tears. It's okay, I hugged him. It's okay. Listen, you guys, you kids, I have to tell you something. Kim sat down heavily as though she had been expecting this. I put my arm around both of them. I have to go away before Christmas. I have to find a job. There was a long silence. Scotty wrapped his arms around me and cried, No, don't go away, he pleaded. Please, I'll be good. Please don't go away. I kissed the top of his snowsuit hood. Oh, Scotty, you're not bad. Both of you are very, very good. It's not your fault I'm going away. I love you both so much, I've just got to get a job. Kim sat with her hands on her lap, looking straight ahead. I love you a lot, I told them again. I'm really going to miss the two of you. Then why are you going away? Kim's voice pounded with rage. Why can't you get a job here? She needed more of an explanation. Kim, it's not safe for me here because I'm different. Her face softened, which allowed the tears to well up. I'm going somewhere I'll be safe. Can I come too, she asked. I pulled Scotty closer to me and extended my arm to Kim. She didn't move closer, but I could tell she wanted to. It's not really a place I'm going to. I wondered how much the unwritten laws allowed me to tell a child. Imagine that you're looking for me in a room. You look everywhere, in the closet, under the bed, behind the door, but I'm not there. Scotty looked up. Where are you, he asked. I'm somewhere safe where no one would look. I'm up near the ceiling. Imagine you're looking for me here, behind the trees, under the benches, behind the elephant house. Where would I be that's safe? Both kids looked at each other and shook their heads. Up in the sky where the wind blows, I told them. I'd be safe in the sky where no one would look for me. But I'm still around. I'll still be watching over you. Scotty wiped the tears from his eyes with his mittens. When I grow up and be the wind, I could be in the sky with you. I nodded and pulled him closer. Tears dripped down Kim's chin, but her face appeared calm. Can you come back and visit us? I thought before I answered. You'll see me again, but not for a while. Not till it's safe for me to come back. I pointed to the golden eagles nearby. You know, there's not many eagles left. The food they eat got all poisoned with chemicals, and sometimes people shot at them. You know what the eagles did? They both shook their heads. They flew high up into the mountains, way up above the clouds, and they're going to stay up there and fly around in the wind until it's safe to come visit. Kim knelt on the bench and put her gloves on my cheeks. They were cold and wet with snow. Please take me with you, she whispered. 
My eyes burn with tears. I have to hide alone with him. And your mommy loves you a lot. She needs you too. Grow up the best way you can, Kim. I'll come back to you, I promise. The snow was falling so heavily that it nearly covered us on the bench. I got up and brushed us off. I kissed Scotty's cold nose before I retied his scarf across his face. I waited on one knee for Kim to come to me. She fell into my arms so hard we both almost tumbled over. As we approached the eagles, Kim ran ahead. She stopped and watched them. Are they happy in there, she asked me. I shook my head. They'd be happier up there. I looked at the sky. Snowflakes fell on my eyelashes and cheeks. Can we make snow angels now, Scotty demanded. I nodded. Scotty and Kim flopped backward in the snow and thrashed their arms and legs. Look at me, look at me, they each shouted. I made a snowball and rolled it until it was as big as a boulder. What are you making, Kim asked. They both came close. I'm making a snow woman, I told her. Kim made a face. It's not a snow woman, it's a snow man, she told her. How do you know, I asked her. You haven't seen her yet. Scotty started rolling a tiny lump of snow. Can I help make her, he asked. I nodded and started a good-sized snowball for him. Kim stamped her foot. There's no such thing as a snow woman, it's a snow man. I put Scotty's smaller snow boulder on top of the first. Help me make her head, I told them both. Kim flew into a rage and sobbed. I touched her shoulders. Are you really that upset? She nodded and cried. I wiped her running nose. It's okay, Scotty said gently. She could be a snowman, right? I nodded. Help us make his head, okay? Kim sniffled and nodded. We rolled the head and I put it in place. I scrounged for stones under the snow and we used them to make a mouth and nose and eyes. He needs a scarf, right, I asked. They both nodded. I pulled off my scarf and put it around his neck. I took out my pack of cigarettes. No, they both shouted in unison, don't smoke. <laughs> well, I don't have a pipe for the snowman. Should I put a cigarette in his mouth? No, they shouted, he doesn't smoke, he's smart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I laughed, but that's a pretty good looking snowman we made, isn't it? Scotty nodded and fell on the ground. Watch me make a snow angel. He wildly flailed his arms and legs. Are you okay, I asked Kim. She nodded. I pulled her scarf snug around her neck. I'm sorry I upset you, I told her. I was just teasing. She shrugged. It's okay. I'm sorry anyway, I said. No, she told me. I mean, it's okay about it being a snow woman. I smiled. How about if we decide that this is a snow person? and we like him or her just the way she is. Kim nodded without smiling. She silently stared out the car window during the long ride home. Did they eat, Gloria wanted to know? I nodded. Time for your bath, she told them. Aw, oh, Mom, we're too poop, Scotty said. Gloria laughed. All right, smart Alex. But tomorrow night you both take a bath and I don't want to hear any whining. Scotty beamed in triumph. Can Jess put us to bed? Gloria glanced at me and then I nodded. Scotty and Kim changed into their pajamas and kissed Gloria goodnight. I tucked each one under their covers. You have to read us the story about when we were little kids, Scotty instructed me. I picked up the book from the nightstand. Kim pointed to a bookmark. That's where Mom left off, she said. 
I began to read, my voice quiet and low. Where am I going? I don't quite know. Down to the stream where the cane cups grow. Up on the hill where the pine trees blow. Anywhere, anywhere, I don't know. Scotty yawned. I kissed his sweaty hair. A mobile turned slowly over our heads, casting the shadows of moving ships against the walls. If you were a bird and lived on high, you'd lean on the wind when the wind came by. You'd say to the wind as it took you away, that's where I wanted to go today. My voice cracked like a teenage boy's and then dropped a bit deeper as I read. The hormones were beginning to work. Kim stared at me. Her face was still and sad. I'm never going to see you again, am I? She asked. I came over to her bed and kissed her forehead. I'll come back to you when it's safe. You'll see me again, I promise. I love you, Kim. Go to sleep now. She sighed and pulled the covers up to her chin. I continued to read until her breathing became heavy and rhythmic. Where am I going? I don't quite know. What does it matter where people go? Down to the wood where the bluebells grow. Anywhere, anywhere. I don't know. Anyway, that's how I got to know Minnie Bruce Pratt while I was waiting to see if my message was going to work. 
And here we are a year later, but you get to meet her too by reading her books, which are here still. So.
You know, and transgender is like the first word that we've chosen. And it is such a broad umbrella term, and that's a good thing, because it, it's like an open door for people to, to be able to say to people, do you feel that way? Is that how you felt too? Well, then this community is open for you too. So it's not that I'm trying to be purposely vague about it, but in a way, if you think about it, you know who we are, and you know who you are. <laughs> There's one more specific question that I would like to ask. Okay, and then I'm going to call on you. Uh, I want you to explain uh, emphatically, if you, uh, by transgender, uh, do you have a sex organ in the The question that was just asked of me is about my sex organ. And to tell you the truth, I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> yeah, the question is, I'll repeat the questions in the back. You've been very patient that day. It's a stuffed between children book and mystery novel. <laughs> um, the question is, could I talk about being too queer for queer? Well, you know, I feel about movements like I feel about myself. The only way you cannot make a mistake is to not do a damn thing. And I feel that young movements, when they begin, strive for a theory that explains their history and their place in the world, strive to open up and define a community, and move things forward, and that's progressive. And I don't think that um, that the mistake that I feel the women's movement made by keeping lesbians out initially, or that the lesbian gay community made about butchers and drag queens and others, uh, mean that those movements are, you know, oh sure, once a movement comes into power, then they turn reactionary or they turn on their own. I don't think that's necessarily true. First of all, I think that human understanding builds you know, it takes a movement, it took a movement to even get people to admit that there was institutionalized sexism in this society. When I grew up, you know, somebody said, sexism, women oppressed, why honey, because some guy opened the door for you, you girls have it easy, you don't even have to work. I mean, now, even the most die-hard sexist pig admits that there's institutionalized sexism, it's just he's for it. You know? <laughs> When I grew up in Buffalo, there didn't have to be water fountains or facilities marked segregated because the whole city was segregated down the middle, you know, and nobody talked in the, in the white Buffalo, you know, they didn't talk about the segregation, they didn't talk about the fact that there were two Buffaloes, that once you crossed Main Street, you were in an African American city, and it was poor. And then when you crossed Main Street, it was all white, you know? It just didn't even get discussed. It took a movement, it took rebellions in Buffalo to make people admit how deep and entrenched and institutionalized the racism was. So my point with all this is just that, you know, sometimes you have to fight just for the right for people to admit that you're oppressed. And it doesn't mean that you know everything yet. You know, the lesbian gay movement, the women's movement, I don't think they set out purposely to exclude anybody or to make anyone's life miserable. But the theory that divided women on one side as allies and men on the other side as enemies, which is sort of a vulgarized simplification, but roughly, you know, in retrospect we can see puts Sojourner Truth and Margaret Thatcher on one side and John Brown and John Rockefeller on the other. Oh, we knew that then. I know that. <laughs> but mass movements are not individuals. You know, they, they have their own growth and development. And so I really think that the attempts to see a masculinist society, to see gender expression as the oppression, you know, the way women were being forced to be feminine and the way masculine men were treating women, ended up putting all the emphasis on gender expression and not on how deeply institutionalized oppression was. It made everybody look at each other and say, well, you're just too butch. You remind me of men, and you're too femme, and you're selling out to the patriarchy, and 
by the time you're done, it's like you and me and I'm not so sure about you, you know. And it's a more sophisticated movement now, I think, that's trying to look for theory that opens up the movement, that makes it more inclusive, that explains our relationship to each other as allies, even if it wasn't simple and obvious years ago. Now, because I think this question is so important, if you don't mind me rambling just a little bit more on it, I also think it was a deep historical misunderstanding about the relationship between the way people express their gender, whether, how they express their being masculine or feminine, and who they love. <clears throat> when I came out before Stonewall, it was differently gendered lesbians and gay men who were out and in the bars. It was drag queens and butches and those who loved us, a very highly stylized gender community who was out. We were the tip of the iceberg. And there were no closets for us to hide in. We were out there by virtue of our, here comes one of them now, you know, you can see us. And so, since no one had ever seen the whole iceberg, people just assumed that's what it means to be gay. So no wonder when somebody wanted to go to the bar, people say, well, are you butch or femme? Because you just gotta be one or the other. It wasn't that we were trying to oppress anyone or exclude anyone. It's that we didn't know. That's all we had ever seen. That's all most people had ever seen. But we were also on the front lines of battles that helped midwife the modern liberation movement. And it enabled millions of closet doors to blow off their hinges. And suddenly we could see more of the population and say, look how many ways there are to be lesbian or gay. And look how much gender diversity there is within that community. But, see, then how were transgendered or differently gendered lesbians and gay men viewed as being this sort of embarrassing cusp. You know, we were the dinosaurs. Like, if you just wait a generation or two, they'll be gone. You know. But what I think is that now another huge population is beginning to surface and that is the gender community. And now we're beginning to see how many different ways there are to be transgender. That transgender people are lesbian and gay and bi and straight and asexual. That we have many different life experiences or ways of describing our sex or our gender. There's so much diversity in that population. The way I see it, it's like two overlapping circles like two huge populations that partially overlap. And I'm one of those people who's in that part that overlaps. And for me, it feels like having a foot in one of each of two rowboats. I have a very deep personal need for them not to go in opposite directions. <laughs> so I think that the more we understand historically how these movements have emerged, and begin building on the experiences that we've learned, the more we'll stop trying to throw overboard those who are embarrassing to a movement. You know, there is always a current in a leadership that's more conservative that wants to disown the people who aren't normal. And I say, normal? <laughs> normal? Like, I want to be normal like Jesse Helms? Not with my last breath, you know? I First of all, we could never be as normal as our enemies. They, they will never <laughs> accept us. We could throw everybody overboard. They still are going to call us queer because we are. You know? If that's normal, I don't want to be that. But what it does do, it doesn't get you a damn thing. But what it does do is it weakens the movement. And I know in New York City, for example, whenever there was a, a, a gay rights bill before the city council, the New York Times would run this stock editorial. They'd say, well, what are these people asking for men in high heels and dresses to be firefighters? And you have this current who would say, oh, no, no, we're not like that. You know, that's these other people. We're, we're, we're like you, you know. And I say to them, well, any transvestite would know to wear sensible shoes on a job like that. <laughs> no. We won't stand for job discrimination against anybody. We're going to stand together on it. That's building a stronger movement in my book. Uh, I'm going to call on you first, yes. Um, a question concerning the, the terminology. Uh, mm -hmm. After going through the march and working so hard on transgender... And you did. <laughs> oh, God, I still have a scar. I know. 
I got sent to college during a time when a whole lot of stuff was just kind of breaking down all over the place. And I have never in my life been <laughs> mistaken for a family, even from, you know, the time I was five. I've always had, you know, people address me as sir or mistake me for a boy or whatever. But by the time I got to college, so much weirdness was going on. There were so many boys with long hair and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And it was just, it was okay to be a whole lot of different ways. So that I felt that I fit in someplace. Mm -hmm. Even though at that time I was not really uh, aware of my own sexual orientation or really felt comfortable identifying myself as a lesbian. This was kind of a, like an open window that I could see through. I also came from a Catholic, um, you know, 12 years of Catholic school, so that was another little bit of oppression that I had. But, um, but I can see where if I had gone right from the Catholic school into the Chevy plant, things would have been very different for me. I would have ended up going to one of those bars dressed in a suit and tie or whatever because I was butch. And I think that would have been what my role model was at that time in, in that particular circumstance. But because I went away to college where everyone was dressing in bell bottoms and paisley and the shikis and afros and, you know, all kinds of stuff, that everything just seemed a lot looser for me or something. And I don't know if you have anything to say <laughs> apropos to that or um, have given that a lot of thought or well it's hard for me to sum up in the back because it was more of a statement about how um, gender is expressed differently in different classes and frequently different regions different historical periods etc different nationalities um, and that's true and um, Butch Femme was very much, you know, as I said, the differently gendered lesbian and gay community that was in the bars was primarily working class, and it was a working class expression. It didn't mean it was the only ways to be gay or lesbian. It didn't mean it was the only ways to be differently gendered, since there were many straight and uh, other transgender people at the time who weren't in those bars either. Uh, to me, the biggest observation about class and gender that I can make is that look at the ways in which we are constantly being pitted against each other within the working class. The ways that we're pitted against each other on the basis of race, of sex, of who we love, of what we wear, of how we express ourselves, all of these, we are constantly growing up being taught to pit sameness against difference. And that to me, the biggest question is not the role of class in examining Butch Femme. Clearly, this was a segment of the working class, gay and lesbian and transgender communities. But the way it, gender oppression becomes a class weapon, that to me, you know, is the biggest lesson about class is that it's another way in which we are being pitted to fight each other instead of coming together and fighting for genuine change. And so, to me, if there was one thing that you left with tonight, it's that nobody ever talks about gender oppression from the point of view of being a class weapon, the way racism is. You know, and there's a lot of reasons. For example, the pamphlet that um, Linda talked about that I brought tonight in the slideshow looks at the fact that whole campaigns have been set in motion, for example, during slavery and feudalism to demonize people who were differently gendered or people who were hermaphroditic or intersexed. Now, there was a specific reason for that. With the rise of patriarchal class society came the absolute need to partition the sexes in order to pass on property and wealth to male heirs. That was the venue of property and wealth. 
and no one could fall between man or woman. But there are a lot of campaigns historically that once they get set in motion, the bigotry just keeps rolling on generations after people forget why it was set in motion. For example, look at racism. It was really honed as an ideological weapon to so-called justify the slave trade. And yet today, you can talk to racists who will mouth the worst sort of bigotry and they'll say, oh, people have always felt this way. This is just a question of human nature. You just can't change people. People have always been racist. You know? And so this attitude that you know, there's always been feminine women and there's always been masculine men and nobody's ever liked the people who fell between is not true. It's just not true, but people have forgotten why things got divided up the way they have. So, I'm rambling again, but... The pamphlet is for sale. The pamphlet is for sale. It is two fifty. <laughs> it will only touch on some of the things that I've talked about tonight, but it will give you a sense of when and where and why this bigotry was really set in motion in a very conscious way. I'm sorry, I, I promised this woman next. Yes. I was just wondering how much of Jess's story is actually Leslie's story? Is it a whole book? Or? Oh, this is the question I was waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> the, the question is, how, is Leslie Feinberg Jess Goldberg? Is this my story, you know. So I'll tell you what I tell everybody because this is the truth. Is that I decided to write a novel because I wanted to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And I didn't think I would in an autobiography. So I chose fiction. Now, granted the curtain is a glass one. <laughs> it's not so protected. But it is fiction. And by creating a character who was fictional, Jess Goldberg, I found this amazing thing. It was like an epiphany, but uh, without any metaphysics involved. I found out that fictional characters are like children. Just because you create them doesn't mean they do everything you tell them to do. <laughs> they can go off in their own direction. And so I discovered that if I was really going to write fiction, then I was going to have to have an integrity to this character to develop her own consciousness through her own experiences. And I couldn't just make her say something just because I was the one at the computer. So it is certainly, it draws on the spirit of my life. It tells you what I want you to know, but I am not just older. I hope I know more than she does, but <laughs> only by virtue that she only lived for 301 pages and I've lived for almost 44 years. I just wondered, um, I love your book. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I wondered, when you started writing, um, I know that you wrote The Peace and Persistent Desire, but uh -huh. you always kept a journal your whole life. and Oh, kind of no. Stuff. I have never kept a journal. <laughs> I have never written fiction. I have, you know, I didn't know how to write until I became political in the movement, like, more than 20 years ago. And then the way I learned to write was through journalism, through political journalism. And I've written every week for 20 years for Workers' World newspaper, like two, three articles a week, 40 to 60 lines. And I thought, well, you know, I could do that. I could write anything. Oh, my God. <laughs> Fiction is so different. The only thing I did learn from that is how not to indulge myself in writer's block. You know, you just, if you're going to write weekly for a newspaper, you write whether you've got cramps or you just broke up with somebody <laughs> or you're getting addicted, you just write it. Um, but I wrote, I wrote the letter to a 50s femme in the middle of the night one night during a thunderstorm. And may I suggest to all of you with a computer that you never do that. <laughs> and I can't tell you why I wrote it, except that I was feeling so bad that I wanted to tell myself a story and I couldn't even tell the real... I, I, I couldn't sit down and write my own story. I just sat down and wrote it fictionally. And I thought, you know, this is more how I feel than a diary or a journal. And in the morning, I didn't know what to do with it. I don't write fiction. So I had it across the street in bare feet and dropped it in a mailbox and sent it to the Lesbian History Archives. And I thought, 
maybe someday somebody will read this and it will mean something to them. But if it sounds stupid, I don't want anybody to know I wrote it. Because <laughs> I've never heard my own fiction voice. And so, um, I don't know, months, months and months later, maybe a year later, Joan Nestle said to me, I'd like you to submit something to Persistent Desire. And I said, well, I have this thing, I don't know. And um, finally, my friends got so annoyed, they said, you know, we'll violate all your privacy and we'll just go take the damn thing and send it into her yourself if you don't stop carrying on about this. Just send it already. What's the problem? I said, oh, I don't know. It's very personal. Uh. So finally, I took this thing to Joan and she laughed and she took me in a room and here were all the pieces that she had laid out for Persistent Desire and this anonymous piece was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so then... Um, Somebody said to me at the time, well, maybe it was a fluke, so why don't you write another one? So I wrote the... <laughs> a good friend, she told me the truth, you know. Um, so I wrote the Butch to Butch a love song, and then she said, now you got to write a book. And I said, no, oh, no, 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 uh-uh, I don't think so. And we actually did have an argument about it, because I had already discovered from those first two pieces that writing fiction was so revealing, even though it wasn't me. You know, I mean, it was fiction, right? But I felt like there was so much of me in it that I didn't want to do it. But instead of being honest that way, I said, no, nobody will read it, it's not time, uh, I carried on. And finally I had to admit, oh, I don't want to read it because I don't want anybody to read it. You know, I don't want to write it because people will read it and then there I'll be, you know. So anyway, I worked through all that and I took those two pieces and I... Um, and then sent it to Firebrand within like six months after the Persistent Desire. And then uh, it was sort of like a fairy tale because the publisher called me up a week later. As a matter of fact, a week after I hadn't heard from her, I called up the friend who encouraged me to write it and I was just kidding. And I said, well, it's been a week and they haven't called me, you know. <laughs> and she said, oh, honey, you didn't really think they were going to call you in a week. you got to be patient. This could take a long time. And then I got this call from the publisher like two hours later saying she wanted to buy and I called my friend back and she said, oh no, you're not going to get me twice. <laughs> no, I don't believe you. And um, I, six months or eight months later, it was going to press. So if I was going to write a short story about this, I wouldn't write that because nobody could read it. <laughs> but it's true. You say where we progressed over the last 25 years to get your out, which you done well. Where are we going in the next 25 years? I feel like the great Karnak if I try to... Gene Dixon. Um, I don't know, and that's what I think is so important about struggling for change, is that I don't think the future is fixed. If it were, we could just all rent a video and go chill out and let it happen, you know. Um, I don't know, you know. I do know that I've been to 30 or more cities now and everywhere I go people are talking about building a more inclusive movement and are saying why on earth would we want to narrow the movement and people aren't just being tolerant of diversity they're actually excited about it you know um, at dinner tonight Linda said something very interesting she said that she thought we had matured enough to be confident enough about ourselves to be interested in the differences of others. And I think it's true. And so, where we take the movement is our collective will. How much energy we're going to put into it and how much thought. Well, yeah. Um, I'd like to thank you, Leslie, for um, coming out to being yourself. It's something that uh, I think you have dug the foundation. And now it's up to us and our generation on to build the building because you've done the roof work for it. And the foundation has been laid. Now it's up to us and for our generation on to build that building. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you hear that back there? Well, this strong sister said her generation is going to pick up the ball now. And what would it and all I'd say is, well, wait a minute, we're not too old, let us come along too. <laughs> How about if we all do it together? And I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Uh, my perception is that you, um, what you're saying is that um, society has defined heights over here and ties over here, and you want there to be a spectrum somewhere between where everyone can, can fit in. And I'm just wondering if, uh, if you... I, I'm not sure if I really get this from the book or not, is whether uh, it's a, I'm not the little girl.
subject, but I think the question is, was Jeff saying she was not the kind of little girl that they were trying to force her to be, or was she saying she was something else entirely, like a different gender? Well, no, oh. what I mean is, did she feel that she was not a girl, but she was like something more like a boy, or was she not a girl, but just not not a boy either? <laughs> See, this is what I think the problem is, is that it's not so much that I'm arguing that there should be a spectrum of gender expression or sex, but that there is, that there are people who fit this whole circle that I was talking about, and they're really hurting and bleeding for being different. And I'm defending their right to be who they are. But in a society in which you're only offered boy or girl, feminine or masculine, it's very hard to say, well, when you were growing up, did you feel this? Are you really that? Are you? you know, I don't even talk about gender in abstraction because gender is so rooted to the historical period that you're talking about. The, the town you're talking about, the sex you t I mean, it's very rooted. You know, it's not so abstract. I do read these things sometimes, you know, about, you, you know, you could get your doctorate now in gender theory. And I think it's a good thing, you know, that it's being studied more. But sometimes I read some of these things and I think, well, I know this is supposed to be about me, but I don't understand it, really. Because it becomes so abstract, it's like, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, you know? Really, when you remove it from social concepts and, and repression, you know, I think that if you defend the right of people to be themselves, and if you fight for a recognition that there really is gender diversity in the human population, but that it's being repressed and oppressed, then you open the door for people to express themselves in different ways, name themselves differently, explore how they're feeling growing up or whatever. And if you don't and you try to force it into binary opposites, people are bereft of language and concepts to explain their own experience. So I think that, I don't know what the future will be like, maybe there'll be more than two sexes, you know? Maybe, maybe people will identify as a third sex. You know, we think of man, woman, there's nothing else. But just a couple of hundred years ago on this very continent, there were societies that recognized three or four or seven gender slash sexes. Now, why is that? How could one society say there's nothing but men and women, and another one say maybe there's three, maybe there's seven, you know? What it means is that our concepts are not absolute. You know, they are concepts and they'll change with a struggle. There may be new language that emerges. When I was a kid, if anybody had told me that instead of being Miss or Mrs., someone would refer to themselves as Ms., I would have said, uh-huh. You know, you could never get people to call you Ms. Now the New York Times uses Ms. You know, I, it hasn't been that long that that's come into popular usage. Maybe there'll be ways that pronouns will change. The concepts of sex and gender will be reflected in new ways in language. If that's the case, Kids growing up will have different ways of describing themselves. All I could do was take the life of one kid growing up in the McCarthy period and show that she, like many other people, didn't fit and that it's a crime because all of society loses all of the originality, the creativity, the humanity of people who are being oppressed in this society is being lost to all of us collectively. So. I don't think that quite answers what you asked, but it's the best I can do. We need to stop these things and give you time to sign books. Okay, fair enough. I have one. No, you've asked two already. <laughs> I'm going to end on this person who hasn't asked anything. Okay, um, there's a, as far as I've seen, a very strong tendency within women's movement and women's community to have events or whatever that are for women or women only. And I was wondering how you feel about that. Oh, boy. And the last question is, <laughs> what about the Michigan Women's Music Festival being a women-born, women-only event? Are you going? No. Well, hmm. <laughs> I, I'll tell you the truth. To me, 
I have to answer the. I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to take a, a few minutes to answer because it's an important question. First of all, it has to be stated that this is a society in which women are oppressed and physically threatened and feel endangered and want a safe space. That means bathrooms, that means concerts, that means women's events. So Michigan Women's Music Festival, I'm going to take two examples, that and a bathroom. Because <laughs> they're two big things. The Michigan Women's Music Festival has a policy of women born women only. Now, two years ago, Nancy Burkholt, who was a male-to-female transsexual, was surrounded by a security team and told they believed that she wasn't born a woman and she was expelled, which was a very frightening experience for Nancy. Now, if you heard about that and you were differently gendered, you could say to yourself, see, the women's movement, that's how they are, you know, they're just going to be hostile to us, there's no, we shouldn't even bother going. But interestingly enough, last year, a group of supporters of transsexual women went back to the music festival and took a poll. It was a very brave thing to do. They asked the women who went to the music festival themselves, do you agree with this policy? And 73% of the women who were polled said that's not right. We are not threatened by having M to F transsexual sisters at this event. These are not wolves in sheep's clothing. You know, this is not like Burt Reynolds coming in and drag trying to, you know, threaten women. This is really important. Now, I think in some ways that there's a class question involved here. For example, the woman who runs the Michigan Women's Music Festival is running a business. You know, her father owned a mill, he ran a mill town. She runs the Michigan Women's Music Festival, she runs that town. As far as I know, her workers still have not been allowed to organize unions. The policy of the security team is that town's policy. But 73, three out of, every, three to one, the women who were polled said they didn't agree. Now, that brings me to bathrooms because if I was going to leave with some concrete bit of how to change the world, <laughs> it would start with bathrooms, which sounds very trivial, but it's not when you have to go. <laughs> and when the doors say, men and women. Now, it's sort of like that women born women policy. <laughs> to me, it means I can't go either. I was born a woman, but I don't feel that's what that policy says. It says anything that's related to masculine, to male, to anything that could be threatening to women can't come in, and I'm part of that, you know? So it becomes, well, you know, the female transsexuals can't come in, I can't come in. Will I ever go to challenge that? Maybe, I don't know, you know. But bathrooms are a big deal because they're every minute of your life, you know? I actually think about in the morning before I go to the gym, whether I'm going to eat or drink anything before I can go to the gym to figure out whether I'm going to have to use the bathroom or not. It shapes my life because when my bladder's full and somebody's screaming at me or they call security or they call a cop, my day, my day has turned into a nightmare, you know? My life is riddled with nightmares like these. For example, I was in a women's martial arts camp. There were 500 of us. Here I was in a gi in the middle of the night talking to my lover on the phone, bare feet, my little green belt wrapped around my waist, you know. And security came with drawn guns and said, we heard there's a man on the phone, get out of that booth, you know. And the next mi morning I called a meeting with the women and said, out of 500 women in this camp, how many black belts are there? Are we really afraid of some skinny little guy, even if you think that's a guy in a gi and bare feet in the middle of the night on the phone, that we can't handle it in a sisterly way, that we have to call in cops with guns. What does that say about our confidence as women? The same is true with bathrooms. Yes, we have a real need to know if a man comes into the bathroom. Because what is his motive? It could be rape. There could be another man behind him. Is he hassling? What is, why is he here? And you know, when women see a man come into the bathroom, they say, 
oh, oh, you know, wrong bathroom, and he gets embarrassed, and everybody looks at the sign, and he leaves. You know, <laughs> that's a real security situation. That's real, and that's valid. But try having a butch woman come into the bathroom and watch the eyes roll and the elbows and the excuse me, do you know what bathroom you're in? That is not a genuine women's security issue. That is gender phobia. That's harassing somebody who's coming in the bathroom. You can see from their body language how humiliated and on the defensive they are. And if we don't separate out our real security needs as women from this kind of phobia and this kind of bigotry, then we harm ourselves. So I think, you know, that if you see somebody come in the bathroom and you think maybe they had a sex change, or you think maybe this is a butch and you hassle that person, you can't say that it was because you feared for your safety. And you really have to look at the question that if there are only going to be men's and women's bathrooms in this society in which sexual oppression is really very complex and widespread, then maybe we either have to have toilets or we have to have bathrooms that are marked men and sexually oppressed. <laughs> Thank you all for being here.